Mark here for Mark 2.0, and we welcome just, it's, it's such an honor to have Gary Clark on the Mark 2.0 podcast. Do you remember him from the 80s, uh, Danny Wilson, you know, Second Summer of Love, Mary's Prayer, you name it. This is such an honor, Gary. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, it's my honor. Thanks for having me. And I want to start out by you discussing you know, your early roots in music and then what it was like to come up in the 80s, such an iconic era. I know. It's kind of funny to, to look at it now. The way people view the 80s is not the way it felt from the inside of it, but I but I get it in retrospect. But, um, you know, it was a real... Looking back on it, it really was a period of quite a, a lot of imagination in what people wore and what people, the kind of, the music was pretty free at that time as well. And record companies had the money to be able to kind of let you experiment. And so it wasn't, I think we're in a much tighter place now. Um, and when I look back on it, I think, God, I was lucky to be making records at that point, you know, so. Well. Yeah, I, but, um, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I'd sort of think about even like, when you used to go to, certainly in Scotland anyway, there was there was a few music clubs that, um, you know, and, and the musicians would go as well, but you'd see all the bands that were coming through town. Um, probably the, the, the biggest one was called Fat Sam's and every Sunday there would be a, there would be a, a, a live band on and I saw, you know, everything from Prefab Sprout to like well, yeah. Hue and Cry and um, just, referencing your t-shirt there oh, yeah. and but, but not just you know like um it was really eclectic the the music that we were exposed to but also uh, when i think back on it now the kind of crowds of people there was there was no maybe it's because of the size of the town as well mm -hmm. but it was kind of like the bowie freaks in one corner and there oh, was yeah. the sonatas in one corner and there was you know the punks in another it was, it was kind of like just this, this crazy melting pot which and that's what i get when i sort of see the videos and stuff from the 80s this kind of like crazy melting pot of stuff isn't it you know yeah and you, it's funny, you brought up the clubs, which is a great point. I didn't even think of that. But look at mm -hmm. things like uh, MTV, Top of the Pops, uh, TV shows like Fame, uh, Footloose, movies mm -hmm. like Footloose, that just really music-oriented and dancing-oriented, mm -hmm. you know, that influenced it. Yeah. I mean, Top of the Pops goes back earlier in the UK, but I guess it was really at its height in the 80s um of popularity and people but it really was a thing where everybody tuned into top of the pops it was like thursday evening i think it was on at seven o'clock in the evening and you didn't you know there was nobody you knew who didn't watch it who was into no. music anyway. and not even just into music it's like everybody knew what was in the charts and you know i don't know music seemed to really be a big part of people's lives at that time and mm. what was your experience on, on Top of the Pops? Because other artists that I've interviewed, they're like, you know, of course you want to be on Top of the Pops, but it's such a small studio and just like, it's all uh, pre-recorded, right? You're not performing live. Um, actually, the it's slightly combination of both. Oh, they yeah. they pre-record in the afternoon and that's kind of like a safety thing. And then in the evening, they go out live. Earlier shows in the 70s, there was a lot more live singing and stuff. Um, but by the time we were doing it in like 87, um, it was pretty much all lip synced, you know, mime to the record. Sure. Um, but people used to like to have fun with that safety thing. Uh, there's, there's famously ones uh, where Robert Smith from The Cure changes his shirt at the last minute. So, oh, and then he deliberately makes a mistake. So he's going like white shirt. Black shirt. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Because they had to cut between them if if, sure. if 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 something went wrong, you know. So he'd walk off the mic and then and suddenly he'd appear with a black shirt on. You know? Yeah. But um, top of the I mean, it was it was so iconic by that time that it was a real thrill to get to to play it. You know, we did it I think three times over the twice with Second Summer of Love, once with Mary's Prayer, I think. Um, but yeah, that was that was, it was it's all it's 
as I say, it's like looking back on it now, it's very special to experience those things, but that when you're a young guy just going through it, you're just sort of going through it, aren't you? You don't really, you're not taking it in. And what about the music videos? Uh, because when I talked to Greg Kane, A Few and mm. Cry, one of the music videos, they're like, you know, yes, the music videos, but they, they wasted so much money on that. And then you look at it and you're like, this is it. And I think, uh, you know, Labor of Love got banned or something, the, the music video for it. After they probably spend a hundred. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing though, because MTV was so huge that oh, it could awesome. really break a record internationally. So they'd, they'd spend these crazy amounts on the video. Of course, yeah. all of this gets charged back to the bands and the artists in the end of the day, <laughs> you know, but like we'd, so we had no concept of that when we were doing it, but you just wanted your record to get to as many people as possible. And so, and video at that time could enable you to have a hit in the United States when you were in Scotland or whatever, yeah. you know, it really was a re kind of revolutionary, the video. And so the record labels, and as I, as I, so I think I mentioned this earlier, it was maybe just before we came on, but the record labels had a lot more liquid cash back then, you know, um, it was the, I guess it was the height of the CD era and the CDs were so cheap to make and they were selling so many of them that it really was a boom time for major record labels. So there was, you know, again, when I look back on it, I go, God, it was like, you know, the, the expense accounts and stuff were crazy and the, the, the limousines and all that stuff, you know. Um, but the, the, the um, videos, I can remember realizing that we had spent three times the budget that it cost us to make the whole album on yeah. two videos or something, you know, and going, what the, you know, this is crazy. I know what exactly works. what you mean. Now, do you prefer the current digital age and where you're going out performing live and uh, digital is how you promote it? Or do you miss the record store days where you could go in, physically buy an album, check it out? Well, I was uh, even in the height of the CD period, I was a vinyl junkie and always picked up vinyl and way beyond that trip to the vinyl store is just the best thing ever. And I, I still love, there's a few nice vinyl stores around where I live now in Dundee, actually. Um, and the, the, cause vinyl's kind of making a comeback, which is really nice to oh, see. Yeah. But, but I went through a period when everyone was buying CDs, but it just meant that you could buy amazing vinyl for like next to nothing, you know, secondhand stuff. Sure. Um, I always love vinyl. And so when the, other guys in the, there used to be a storeroom at the bottom of Virgin Records downstairs. And when you'd, you'd spend a whole day there doing promo or whatever, they'd say, do you want to go to the storeroom? And that was like a big thrill because you basically got to help yourself to all the current records oh, or even yeah. anything that was on the label, you know. People would leave with bags full of CDs, but I would leave with bags full of vinyl. So I've got, <laughs> I've still got a great That's collection true. of all those 80s, um, you know, the b bands that were on, on Virgin at the time, you know. So, yeah. Now, now that we're on the top topic of '80s music, what were your five favorite uh, songs from the '80s and your five favorite artists? Ooh, you're putting me on the spot there. <laughs> yeah. but the uh, songs will be harder, um, but artists. And um, these three, um, my probably biggest influence artists kind of come from the sev the late seventies was when I got into them, but they all had amazing careers through the eighties. And that is Bowie, um, Steely Dan and Stevie Wonder. And then other things that were really big for me in the eighties would be Talking Heads was a massive influence on me. Um, in fact, there was a kind of period that was a bit all that I listened to was Remain in Light and, you know, um, what, what, that's, four, that's four, geez, it's just so many. Yeah. It's crazy. Anyway, let's let, let songs, in terms of songs, I'd say, oh, I don't know, that's too hard. I okay. changed the 
Yeah. Give me another. Give me an easier question. Was it, the was Silicas it, are so much. My brain's overloaded. Were you me. into all different genres, or was there just a specific one that you were more focused on? No, I was always very eclectic in my taste. I still really am. Um, I think I, I have a sort of instinct about whether there's love in a record or not. You know, I sort of, I think great records can come from anywhere, but you can hear when, or I think you can, you can feel actually when something's got real, um, the power to move you. And that could be in so m many different ways as well. You know, I think it's almost, I certainly would say as a songwriter, it's almost as difficult to make people feel good as it is to make them cry, you know? Mm. It's like, so a lot of records that I love are records that just make you, that really uplift the spirit, you know? But then I also love records that leave you in tears in your beer, you know? <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I'm the same. And I love to dance, so, you know, yeah. it's all that stuff. Yeah. So the whole nine yards. Now let's talk about uh, Danny Wilson. How did that uh, come about? What was the uh, story behind the name? And what was it like to have Mary's prayer be an international sensation? Mm, well, yeah, that was... So I'll go back to the beginning. The Because the band was really three of us. There was myself, Jed Grimes, and Jed and I were at the same school together and we were the same age. So we had the school band and um, all of that stuff. And we moved to London together when we were 19 to try and, you know, get in the music business and get a record deal and all that stuff. Um, it was pretty disastrous, but we learned a lot. And after about three years of pain and misery and living in a squat, we moved back to Scotland just to regather our strength really and also just to figure out what we were going to do next our drummer left our keyboard player had left and so it was kind of just jed and i back in scotland trying to figure out what to do and when i got back my kid brother had formed his own school band and i went along to a rehearsal and i was like really blown away by what he was doing and i spoke to jed about it we went and saw them play and he, he had a lot of great frontman qualities, even though I was going to be singing the songs of Dan, the Danny Wilson stuff. And it was kind of really already a pre-existing band. And some of the, the songs that went on to the record, the first album were already written. I think Mary's Prayer, yeah, Mary's Prayer was already written and demoed and everything. Um, so it was kind of, it was a project that was, that was, that was, um, well underway and I said to Kit how would you feel about joining the band but you could be free to do your own band and I didn't at that point you've got to remember we didn't have a record deal or anything it was just to take it to the next place wherever that is you know um, and he agreed to do that and we played in a little bar in Edinburgh and there was a a music journalist this guy used to work for the local city council um during the day and at night he became the rock journalist and just off of his own steam he kind of started to write for originally you know, i mean in the beginning i guess small newspapers and stuff and then it built up that he was writing reviews for NME, Melody Maker, Sounds, which were all the big, and at that time, very influential um, music press, the national music press, you know, right through the UK. And um, his name was Bob Flynn. And so we played this little gig and Bob, on some recommendation of some friend of his, came along, wrote this amazing review that went into NME, which is short for New Musical Express, which is a big, um, music paper it was actually a paper but it wasn't a magazine like rolling stone or something it was actually like a big color paper thing um anyway he wrote this amazing review and suddenly we had all those record labels calling bob to find out how do you get in touch with this band mm -hmm. and so this kind of like loose idea of what we're going to do just suddenly all took shape and and we had demand for it, it was kind of overnight and we had a lot of demand for it you know and because jed and i had been through that whole process and we 
there's a kind of there's one missing link to this actually as well and that is that there was a little recording studio in dundee called inner city sound and it was i think it was only like four tracks or eight tracks or something it wasn't it was maybe a wee bit more than that but it was it was pretty primitive and they used to make radio idents and they used to make radio jingles and stuff and in return for letting us use the studio throughout the night they would get us to sing on jingles or play on jingles stuff you know so we were like their kind of house band and would, would do this stuff for free basically but then they would give us all this um studio time and the engineer was great and so we were we had a pretty much an album's worth of material recorded and demoed when this thing with bob happened where he put this great review in the in the newspaper so um when their labels came and they were like can we hear some songs we gave them like mary's prayer a couple of other songs and then like, have you got anything else well yeah we do actually <laughs> you know like we had loads and so we were we, we we'd served our time if you like and we were we were kind of ready for it um by that time um as i say jed and i moved to london when we were both 19. by that time i think we were 23. um because I remember making the first album and having my 24th birthday. So, um, yeah, that was that was the rough timeline of that. And then Mary's Prayer, which was the single that the, the label that Virgin really believed in, didn't actually do very well when they put it out in the UK. It sort of, I think it was like maybe top 50 or something mm. uh, didn't break 40 and so they were really everyone was really disappointed they tried another single but in the meantime virgin america had just opened up and they really didn't have that many bands they just opened up so the very fortunate timing on our part they just had a hit with cutting crew and uh they were they had a whole team of people and not very much music and so um they loved mary's prayer and they started to build up mary's prayer on radio in the us which as you know is a much slower curve than the uk the uk a hit record particularly at that time a hit record would be the whole trajectory is maybe three months max you know whereas um and that's if it if it was a real hit um, it could literally go in and out of the charts in a couple of weeks and goodbye, never hear of it again. But in the States, you have this, because of the actual States and because of the different radio stations across the, the, the United States, um, it's a much slower build. And so you get a much longer trajectory. And Mary's Prayer was just gently kind of making its way up and up the, the charts. And... Um, and getting a lot of radio play. And so Virgin in the UK saw that the US were really leading on that single and got excited about it, released it for a second time. And this time it went into the chart at somewhere around 29 or something. I don't know. Right. And then it, then it stalled. And at the end of the year, um, Radio One, which is the biggest radio station in the UK. It's a BBC station, big pop station. Um, they had a poll, a listener's poll, where people had to vote for the song that they thought should have been a hit. And thankfully, Mary's Prayer won by some nice. large margin. And so that gave Virgin the impetus to release it for a third time. And the third time, it, it really just went, and I think it it reached number two in this country um but was a hit after because of that was then subsequently a hit in a lot of other territories and number one and number number of different countries and um so you know i always am very grateful for that um, american radio system of yours <laughs> yeah and you know what you talked about is so true because i remember a band living in a box right they were mm -hmm. not big in the u.s and they, mm. I remember them being on the radio. Maybe it was only one week because I looked at the uh, chart books because I study those 
Billboard chart books. And I think it said mm. it only charted for a week, but I remember it being on the radio. My dad's like, what the heck is this? Living mm. in a box. He's like, what is yeah. this music you guys are listening to? So exactly. you're right. You know, it's really hard. Uh, it's really much different in the U.S. Yeah. And and it, it I don't think it happens with every... Well, it certainly doesn't happen with every record because we had subsequent singles that where that didn't happen. But but if it does happen, it's great for the band because radio play at that time, you got paid quite well for it. And it's a lot of radio play because you have a big country. And so, you know, like the um, you, at that point, it was much easier to make a living, I think, as a band than it is now. Um, and so that that would keep you, you know, in plectrums and strings for your next album and um it, it was so it was it was really exciting and um and also when we went to the states to play we got a tour with simply red oh, yeah. i don't sure you remember them and oh yeah um, mike mick hucknell yeah yeah and we decided that we would go a little early and do a few dates on our own and the first gig that we played is the 930 club in washington mm -hmm. and washington dc which is still there um i believe it certainly was the last time i looked um and it was honestly the most probably one of the biggest thrills of my whole, whole career because it was such a line in the sand and that was that Virgin America decided to release the album at the same time as the single. So while the single was doing this, people yeah. who just heard it on the radio could go into the record store and they could buy the album. Yeah. And so, which was very wise, because we were much more of an album band in a way. I, I know Mary's Prayers are, are very much a pop song, but the, the album wasn't full of Mary's Prayers. It was much more, I don't know, oh, yeah. artistic esoteric, <laughs> um, obscure, all those words. But they, um, we, I remember sound checking at the 930 club thinking, I don't know if anybody's going to come, whatever, and then going on stage and it was packed and everyone was singing the songs. And we still didn't have that in the UK, you've got to remember. So it was really, really like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. this is crazy. Um, great moment. So, yeah. So, I think part of the uh, influence in bringing the music from the UK and uh, the rest of Europe over here was people like Richard Blade. Do you remember Richard Blade, the radio DJ? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of, out of uh, LA, he brought so much like new wave, pop, you mm -hmm. name it, to the yeah. uh, US. I think the DJs are super important in the US actually because of that and because of the influence that they have. Oh, yeah. Not so much here. There are some big DJs, but it's not, it's more. In in the in your culture, the 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 radio is so. I don't know if it still is, but it certainly was at that time. I don't think ready. so anymore, sadly. But yeah, I grew up on it. So mm. great. Yeah. So after uh, Danny Wilson, the what was the next uh, uh, music act that you were with? Transistor. Well, no, I did one solo album, and. I started to, oh no, actually I did, I did one solo album and then I did a rock album with a, with a band called King L. It's kind of interesting when I, when, when Danny Wilson split up, the solo album song wise is really the, the Danny Wilson album that I would have made if you know, it was the songs that I was writing for Danny Wilson and then the band split up. So it's not a million miles away from that. But by the time that had kind of went out and did its thing, I was in the mood for a, for a change. And I wanted to just get back to playing live in a studio because Danny Wilson was very much a um, like a studio band in the sense that we weren't an actual lineup. So we could overdub things and, you know, we'd get in session players and we'd you know, it was more like a Steely Dan type situation rather than, a, or later Steely Dan thing, rather than um, a band. And I, and I just was craving getting in a studio. And I only really, this only really happened for one album and one tour, but I did this band called King L. And I just asked a few of my favorite musicians that I'd sort of encountered 
one of the guys was from Los Angeles. The drummer was actually from from South Carolina. Um, the, the other guitarist was a guy called Neil McCall, who had been in a great uh, British band called The Bible that I really loved. And um, we just made this one album and we collaborated, wrote all the songs together, recorded it pretty much live with very few overdubs. And it was just my way of getting that out of my system. We did a tour. People, people who still remember going to see the tour said it was amazing. Um, but we sold so few records that there was we, the, the writing was on the wall. It was the it was the same record label, and so they they let us go. And Eric had uh, he had to return to LA because his visa was going to run out in two months, and he'd fallen in love with an English girl called Keely Hawks. And Keeley was a singer who, at the time, was just going out and playing piano and singing on, on her own. And Eric said to me, "Well, we've got if I've got two months left on my visa, why don't I stay and um, we make some, write some songs with Keeley, see if we can get some record company interest for Keeley, and uh, you know, oh, I've kind of missed a really important bit out that I think's." actually kind of crucial not just to where it all went from there but what I do today but um, when I got my solo album deal and this slightly relates to talking about the amount of money that was being spent in the 80s that we mentioned earlier on but the the I had it wasn't lost on me that making albums we were spending fortunes in big recording studios and um, all of that gets charged back to the artist at the end of the day. So I had this bright idea myself and a friend who was a recording engineer kind of came up with this in the pub one night and thought, you know, I kept just nagging me. I thought, why don't I take my recording advance and instead of spending it in other studios, I put the equipment into my flat in London and so I basically turned my basement apartment into a recording studio um, with two inch tape and a very early version of Logic on the computer. But I was kind of ahead of the curve in home recording because even though a few big rock stars had their own studios, they were like these big fancy studios whereas now everybody can record at home you know the computer have made and software has made that so much easier but at the time it was you know it was unusual and um i was i remember thinking that i was kind of aware of the fact that i can only record in these big studios when the record label paid for it because it was so expensive and I kind of was ahead of the thought process thinking, but I could be dropped by the record label, which of course I was um, eventually. Um, and I thought, I don't want to have to be saving up money to just to record a song. I want to be able to record a song whenever I want to be able to record a song. And so that was the beginnings of me having a home studio, which I've, I've had since then till this day. And it enabled me to make the transition from record an artist into being a record producer and songwriter for other people, which is what kind of subsequently happened. Um, it made that transition really easy because I could, or not easy, you know, not, it made it a lot easier. I'm not going to say it was easy, but like, um, was there a lot of people doing this or were you, were you really ahead of your game? I think I was pretty far ahead at that time. I didn't yeah, know, that's what I you know, like people had portal studios and, Porta Studios and um, those kind of things, you know, but this was a, this was, you know, quality wise, it was up there with what you could get in a studio, but I was just using the rooms of my flat and the bathroom and, and the, the, had a piano in the lounge and amplifiers in the hallway and, you know, um, made that album and, you know, continued to work there and, and then have studios later, you know. And uh, nowadays you're writing, right, for uh, TV, movies, right? Yeah. And 
And so much of that I do in my own studio as well. It's quite amazing. I go out when I need to record something bigger, like strings, or if I need, um, you know, live drums or something. Um, even though I can do drums to a certain size here, but I um, prefer to go out where I can get a big room, you know, something that you need a big room for. Um, or a live band, I'll go out. But um, most of the stuff I do at home. And um, it's great because it, it, it keeps everything, keeps the cost of everything down. It means you're really light on your feet. If you make a mistake, it's easy to fix. You know, you can... Um, if there's any downside, it's just that I very rarely leave the studio. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's always something to do, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, coming up with the lyrics, does that come naturally to you for like, uh, let's say, Drive It Like You Stole It from Sing Street? How, how did that come about? Um, well, I'm a great believer when it comes to songs that a strong concept, and that usually includes the title, is hyper important and i've been in sessions before where i've thought this is a really good tune and stuff it just doesn't have a really good idea and if you don't have a really good idea then you don't really have a song so in a, in a way what i try to do is whenever i hear something could be on tv could be somebody says it in the you know cafe next to me whatever i i'll write it down nowadays i use my phone but i used to use you know, dictaphone tapes or notebooks or whatever. And I have a massive kind of backlog of starting points for songs. And so when John Carney, um, the director of Sing Street, because he and I did a lot of the music together, but he had this idea for this um, prom scene and he really didn't have an idea for it. He just knew, he basically said it needs to feel like Super 80s. I think he mentioned Huey Lewis and the News. Hall oh, no. yeah. Okay. And he said, like, I want it to be, like, super, super 80s, but, like, really um, empowering, uplifting, you know. And so my starting point was to try and find a, a song title that would inspire that song. And I went through a whole bunch of, like, phone no notes, and I, I don't know where I'd found it to write it down, but I'd written down Drive It Like You Stole It, and I thought, that feels like the right kind of energy. And those those Huey Lewis songs, and, and I, I, Shania Twain used to do this really well it's also. It's, they always had what I call punchlines in songs, you know, like, man, sure. you know, like a woman, or whatever that is like yeah, this. I like, know what you mean. Bang, right, there you go. <laughs> you know? And so I wanted one of those. And when I saw Drive It Like You Stole It, I thought, that's it, you know. And then the next bit was, I, I, I was really the, and I wanted a big synthesizer sound, so I got up one of those big 80s synthesizer sounds, and I just started playing chords, and then I got that riff, that dun, 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 put that down, and then started singing ideas over the top, and um, sent it to John, and um, he just loved it. So yeah, that was the trajectory of that one. How does it feel to have your work, uh, you know, be used in so many different movies and TV shows? Well, well, that's... it's. Something that I grew up almost as crazy about movies as I did about songs and music. So it really is the ultimate thrill when you see them both together, particularly in a cinema, you know. But it, I'd, I'd had quite a lot of songs placed in movies and TV and things just over the years, like people like a certain song, put it in um, a movie. But, you know, most notably Mary's Prayer was in There's Something About Mary. But I've had quite a lot of other ones. And I what I really wanted to do was write for movies. And I'd never, it's almost a closed book. I just didn't know where or how to get into it, you know. Um, and then I was living in LA and made this kind of wild decision that um, I was working as a, record producer and songwriter freelance working with different artists and i um i don't know i decided that i wanted to take everything that i'd learned there which was masses and kind of take it back to scotland and start developing young scottish artists which i did a bit of 
and I got a couple of them signed to record labels and stuff. But I, that was my plan when I came back. But also to continue to to work sessions with other people when I was asked to do it, either across Zoom or traveling or whatever. Um, but I, when we got back, we bought an old Victorian house and decided to renovate the whole place, which we're still doing <laughs> eight years later. But the, um, we did a massive renovation and, and I couldn't really work because it was just so dusty and noisy. I, occasionally I would rent another studio. But So I had said to, to the, I knew some of the builder guys from when I was growing up and the, the construction guys. And I said, just use me as like your dog's body, you know, I'll do whatever you want, you know. And they, they really enjoyed making me go underneath floorboards and you know, yeah. like do all the dirty work and yeah. carrying all the stuff out to the to the skip. And um, so and I kind of did that for like four or five months. And then I was just ready to go back to work again. I set up a studio in this room before I did it all nice like this. It was just a bedroom that was, um, but I set up a working environment. And then I got a call out of the blue and it was a music publisher friend of mine who basically said, John Carney, the director is trying to get a hold of you. He, he wants to talk to you about a song for a film. And so we, I said, give him my number. So John called me and he t gave me, he pitched me Sing Street, the whole movie. And he actually sent me some, um, written pitch stuff and a couple of scenes and he said that his idea was to get people who had made records in the 80s and have each of these different people write a song for a, you know one of the songs for the movie and so um i just picked a scene and i wrote a song called dream for you which ended up not being in the movie but John loved it so much, he just said to me, why don't you just come on and do the whole film with me? Um, can I send you some of my ideas and, and whatever? So I ended up writing that, the music for that film with him, and it completely just changed the, total, the whole trajectory of my career. Because wow. John and I have continued to work together on, we did two seasons of Modern Love for Amazon, on which I was executive music producer and songwriter and did score and commissioned music and collaborated with artists. And, and then I've just done his um, latest movie, which just um, premiered at Sundance. It's called Flora and Sun. And I was executive music producer on that and wrote a lot, pretty much all the songs, either with John or some on my own. Um, and, and that movie, Sing Street, went on stage stage and and then uh, a film producer in LA saw Sing Street and thought I would be the right person to write stage musical of Nanny McPhee. Mm. And so I went and met with Emma Thompson and she writes lyrics as well. And I've been developing that with her as well for the stage, which we're working on at the moment. And so in the last, since that phone call from John Carney, I have quite literally done so, I mean, I don't know if I've done any, I might have done two or three sessions with, with other people, but I just haven't had time. My whole life has been the film stuff, TV stuff, or the stage stuff, you know? So he and it's was been one of the major influences, at least later on in your career. Massively, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's changed, he's changed the, the whole trajectory of my career, really. And we work really well together, so we do a lot of stuff together. Um, and, yeah, it's just opened up the, a whole other world to me. That I, honestly, if it hadn't been that call from John, I don't know how... I, I can't see how else it would have happened. I like to joke that I moved back from Hollywood to Dundee to get into movies. There you go. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to music, who were some of your favorite uh, musicians that you collaborated with? Collaborated with? Um, I always have a soft, real warm place for Natalie Imbruglia because she was the first oh, yeah. person who was a big artist at the time. She'd just come off the success of Torn and her first album, which sold something like 9 million albums or something. I can't remember. Some ridiculous amount. But um, And 
we met and wrote a couple of songs and then she she basically got me to produce a large chunk of her second album and that was the first kind of major i'd done a lot of other little stuff but that was the first major label thing that um was a big artist really who had the faith to let me produce the record and that did really well and we still we're still really good friends and so sort of, um but yeah it's interesting i've had such a varied kind of career that they um there's no um you know there's no one style that i've ever you know i've worked with such a wide range of people and i love that i think that's i think that is the kind of thing that drew me to writing and recording for other artists because you just get to do everything so you know like i've got country records with kd lang i've got r b pop yeah. records with um Demi Lovato. I've got records with um, Jonathan Davis from Corn, which are like metal, oh, yeah. metal, you know. So there's, uh, I've got, I've done hip hop records, and um, so there's a real freedom. Well, it's interesting that I use the word freedom. It's 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 freeing in terms of the the because as I say, I was really eclectic um, music listener, so. I like that I'm eclectic in the stuff that I work on, and I like to, to I like to challenge myself and and be out of my depth a bit. You know, I think it's when you get exciting stuff. Um, but I I'm also really aware that when you work as a when you work as a songwriter and somebody else is the artist, or when you write as a producer and somebody else is the artist pays to remember that it's not your record, that it's their record. So I, I always try to serve, actually, interestingly, I think I try to serve the, the artistic people. So whether that's the, the director, if it's a movie or the writer, you know, or the, the, the recording artist, to me is more important than pleasing the record label. And a lot of people work the other way around and they go, you know, if you please the record label. Well, what, what I've found is that if artists like to work with you, they'll come back again and again, but also they're much more likely to fight for your track going on the album or being the single or whatever that is, that, um, because they feel connected to it. Because, and, and I think because I was an artist, I've seen when artists feel kind of out of the, 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 the when producers are trying to push them to do something or to go in a direction that they don't want to go in, that's that's the time when I find that I can work with them and maybe end up in the same place or a similar place, but make them feel really connected to it. And I think that's just my experience of being an artist and how difficult it is to be in a recording studio in front of a microphone when everybody's watching you and the producers watching the clock, you know. So. Yeah. Do you think it's uh, better nowadays? Because look at you, you're in uh, Dundee. You can, uh, how with the digital age, you can, you know, record from anywhere in the world. You don't have to be in this certain city. Well, absolutely. And look, interestingly on that, the Modern Love, the, 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 the series, the TV show that I did with John Carney, season one, we were flying all around the world doing sessions season two the pandemic hit oh, so yeah. okay i did the whole of season two all of the music collaborating across zoom with various artists and um uh and then i had to score everything myself in the studio and then at the very last minute the restrictions had started to lift here and we really it, it was so tight it was like a week before all the music had to be handed in and i was like we can book a studio so i booked a studio uh, in scotland and we got some of the best um there's a there's an arrange a string arranger here called peter harvey and he's absolutely brilliant and um i worked with him a lot um in scotland and he knows all the best 
uh, classical musicians and um, from Edinburgh and Glasgow and stuff. So we gathered a bunch of them together to record all the strings for these um, cues that I'd already pre-written and kind of mapped out the, the rough stuff in samples and things. And you, we'd all been locked up for such a long time. It was really hard on classical musicians as well because they couldn't make a living, you know, like nothing was being recorded. And um, it was so amazing and so moving when they first, when they started playing live human beings making that sound in a big room together for the first time since the whole pandemic thing had happened yeah. it was just like a wave of emotion you know it was beautiful um but yeah but a lot of it we had to do remotely and i was working with people all over the place yeah uh, so the technology is you've got you've got to love it when it when it's necessary and when it works <laughs> yeah well, what do you hope people take away from your music? Um, it depends on the piece of music, actually, because they all have a different role to play, you know. Um, and so some songs are just meant to lift you out of your chair and make you feel amazing. And some are meant to hit you in a more deeper, more emotional way. Um, but I think ultimately it's about the sharing and all music is, or all art is actually. But I think ultimately it's like you take a bit of your human spirit and you share it with other human spirits. And it's, that's the magic. That's where the magic is there. Cause it's really, it's, it's the best of us, isn't it? Like the, yeah. when we make something from our hearts, from our souls, and then you, you, hopefully can affect somebody make somebody feel it's, it's it's alchemy when you think about it it's crazy but the idea that you know i could say something record something here in scotland and it's going to touch somebody at the other side of the world is really incredible it's a quite a responsibility actually you know? mm -hmm. so um but you made me think of something there that that is more about scoring um, cause part of this thing that's happened in the last eight years is that I've found myself score, you know, doing film score stuff for, for John and for, um, you know, all, all of it's been for John actually. Um, actually, no, because in, in modern love, there was different directors on each episode. So sure. I worked with a lot of different directors in that sense, but John was the overarching, uh, executive director, but, um, I'm wondering, sorry. Um, what I learned from John was this amazing thing that I, I sort of take with me every time I got to score something. And that is that I'm trying to put this in the right words, but it's like, if you have a really emotional scene, if you put really emotional music on it, it takes away from the scene rather than enhances the scene. Whereas when you do something that has, feels almost passive, the scene becomes bigger and becomes more moving. And it gives it a kind of dignity, for want of a better word, that you can't get by going, oh, you know, when something really sad yeah. happened. And so he, John Carney really taught me that thing of, um, the massive effect that music has on a scene, but also, and that's the same with songs as well, actually, you know, um, songs in picture. Um, giant effect, like sometimes this would particularly happen on Modern Love because we were using some outside songs as well, whereas on um, Flora and Son and on Sing Street, we wrote the music for the songs for it. But um, particularly on Modern Love, um, sometimes say to me, I'm not sure what the song should be on this scene. So like, here's a couple of ideas that you try a few things and I can in Pro Tools here, I can put music against the picture and then send it back to him, send him a quick time. And you would be, your mind would be blown by just how different a scene can be made by a different song or a different piece of music, yeah. you know, how different it makes you feel. It's, it's huge, you know? And so, um, 
And then something clicks and you're just like, oh, that's the right piece of music for that. You know, and like suddenly something's just feels right. That's like, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Cool. Well, this was such an honor to have you on, Gary. Oh, thank you so there, much. Uh, I was, absolute is there pleasure. any place where fans can uh, follow you on social media? Are you into social media? Oh, yeah. All of my stuff is Gary Clark music, one word. Um, and it's G-A-R-Y-C-L-A-R-K-M-U-S-I-C. -G so if it's Instagram, it's at Gary Clark Music, Facebook at Gary Clark Music, Twitter at Gary Clark Music. And uh, that's that's the best place to keep up with new stuff that's coming out and um, um, projects that are on the way and all that kind of stuff. So. Well, great. We really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Gary. Thank you so much. Really nice to meet you. And, yeah. Uh, All right. So long.